Well, good morning. I woke up this morning and I think today is just all together a cruel joke. First of all, my alarm clock said some other time and and she was waking me up this morning. I didn't want to get out of the bed. But you know these schools, you know how they have pajama day? We need to do jammies for Jesus next year at this time. We just get out, get up out of the bed in our pajamas and just come to church and have jammies for Jesus. What do you all think about that? <laughs> it is one of the lowest attended Sundays, notoriously, no kidding, when the, when the uh, spring forward. And uh, I figured that would be a good way to do something a little bit fun. That way I don't have to brush my teeth or change my clothes and stuff. Let's stand and worship this morning. And then in my bones you're bound to move. I feel it in the wind you're bound to ride in. You said that you would pour your spirit out. You said that you would fall on sons and daughters. So You're about to move. I feel it in the wind. You're about to ride in. You said that you would pour your spirit out. You said that you would call on sons and daughters.
Feel it in the wind you're about to ride in. You said that you would pour your spirit out. You said that you would call on sons and daughters. So come. Amen. Amen. Find folks around you. Tell them you're glad they got up and came to church this morning. Good morning, everyone. How are you all? Good. You enjoy waking up this morning? No, I was I was really sad about waking up this morning. I kept thinking that it was later than it was, and so like I was up at like six this morning. It was actually so terrible. But uh, all right, so we have Easter is coming up. That's exciting. And we have a candy donation box out in the foyer, so if you would like to, please donate some candy. Um, you can just throw it in that box. And then we have Acts of Harvest next week, and everyone is welcome to come volunteer at that. All right, so we actually, that's it. We don't have that much going on. But um, so during school, we've had a lot of subs lately, and I've noticed this with the subs. See, they take attendance, or we have this one sub, and she actually had one of the students take attendance. I was like, well, that's pretty smart. You don't even have to do your job. Um, but anyways, she had this student take attendance, and then she asked them, she said, who's going to bring it down to the office for me? And I've noticed, it's, it's a very, like, noticeable trend that all the bad kids say they're going to take it down to the office. They're like, I will. Well, the subs are known now, so the subs know who the bad kids are. So they're like, mm, I don't trust you. And then they're like, Lindsay, Callie, please take this down to the office. See, we, there's like two kids who will take it down to the office. But I thought that this really stood out to me, and I think that being trustworthy is very important. And in Luke 16, 10, it says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. See, a lot of people, um, they often do these things called half-truths. See, but in the Bible, it's saying, well, if you can't tell the truth about something little, then you're not going to tell the truth about something big. So... And then I was, and I, this verse really stood out to me, and I was thinking, what does a trustworthy person look like? And obviously they're honest, but also I think it depends on who you want to be trusted by, and you have to have your priorities straight. So I want to, for me, I want to be trusted by God, so I need to have him as my number one priority. And so as we go into prayer, I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I trustworthy? Am I prioritizing what really matters, which is God? Amen. Thank you, Lindsay. Can we turn this? Is that a little better? Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> uh, well, I do need to let you know that Lindsay is uh, just yesterday performed at Fine Arts at Campbellsville University for the Kentucky District, uh, and she preached a five-minute sermon, and she received a proficient, is that what they call it, and with an invitation to National Fine Arts. Is that right? <clears throat> so she'll get to preach this summer at National Fine Arts in Columbus, Ohio uh, at the end of uh, July. And so that's very exciting and very excited for her. Amen. Um, one thing I did want to tell you that I, I actually, after I left Stuart home last week, I know we had prayer meeting earlier than normal, 
Um, and I, I was hoping that people were still here, but I had, when I came back from Stuart home, everybody was kind of gone. I just wanted to share with the prayer team, uh, and so I'll share it now, that uh, last week at Stuart home was just off the, the charts. It was incredible. Um, I, had, I had kids that were, they were dancing on stage during worship. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, like some that happens every once in a while that they get excited and they're excited. It's just one of those days where they're excited and they're happy to be there and life is good. Um, but this was, it felt different. I, I'll be quite honest with you. It felt completely different. They were doing not just like a, you know, regular kind of dancing jig, but it was like old time Pentecostal sort of dancing on stage. Like that's what it looked like to me. And uh, I'll tell you, it was powerful. I don't know what happened or what was going on, but it was just incredibly powerful. And uh, I just want to let you know that God moves. God moves everywhere. God moves. It doesn't matter who, when, and where. God wants to move. He's going to do what he wants to do. And I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, and so uh, there's uh, two other things that I just wanted to make you aware of. One of them I wanted to announce was that uh, Bishop Joel Brown, who was with us last year, right around this time, matter of fact, uh, is offering a course online. It's kind of, he calls it the Prophetic 101. And it's a, I took the class the last, uh, last month, and it was excellent. So if you're interested in it, it's just four weeks. Uh, there is a fee involved, but it's a Zoom class. Um, it's very interactive, and you get to, you'll learn a lot, and you'll be inspired and challenged. And so if that's something you're interested, it's posted. And the event is posted on our uh, church Facebook, and I can put the link on there again um, so that you can see that and register for that. I believe it starts very soon. Um, also, one other thing, uh, believe it or not, we have around 24, 25 people that are signed up to go to Israel uh, in 2024. So that's very exciting. Uh, we have chosen the dates for that, and it's in June um, can't remember the exact dates, but I can get them for you. So if you're interested in going to Israel in 2024 and you haven't heard this announcement before, please uh, let me know right away. Uh, the, the very first deposit that will have to be made uh, is in September the 1st. So I will obviously have to know that you're going before that point in time. So if that's something you're interested in, I can give you a sample itinerary and let you know also that we will be with uh, Dr. Um, uh, Joe Davis, who is the apologetics professor at Southeastern University, and he will enrich that trip very, very much. Well, it's, everything is inclusive. Uh, once you finally you get to Tel Aviv, uh, breakfast and dinner, and uh, it's about four thousand dollars. We'll pay an extra two fifty to fly out of Lexington, uh, but that's about it. And uh, just so everybody knows, so that it's clear, there's no direct flights to Tel Aviv. Just wanted you to know that. <laughs> that we don't fly from Lexington to Tel Aviv. Just yes, we'll have to change planes a few times. Um, that being said, it will be an incredible 10-day trip. And like I said, uh, we'll have a Messianic guide as well as uh, Dr. Davis with us on that trip. Spa hotels. Uh, like I said, I mean, the food's got to be better in Israel than it is here. I mean... Four-star hotels. There we go. Even better. So we're looking forward uh, to that trip. Um, like I said, if you are interested, please let me know. If you just like in, even information about it, uh, uh, we'll let you know. Um, at this point in time, let's move to prayer. Um, we do want to pray for Ayla's aunt, Marquita, uh, who was just taken into emergency surgery. Um, any other prayer requests that we need to pray for this morning? Sure. For so, yeah, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Pray for the Savoys. Absolutely. They've been had this strep kind of going around, and it's not going away, unfortunately. Yes, sir, Mike. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. We'll pray for Lori. And what's your aunt's name? Uh, Mary. Mary. We'll pray for Mary also. Yes. Yeah. Grieving the loss of his wife. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll be praying for them. Yes. Okay. 
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. We'll be praying for him. Any other prayer requests this morning? Okay. Oh, Kim Nerby. Yeah, Kim, sorry. I knew there was something. I couldn't remember. Kim Lee is not here this morning. Chris is home taking care of her. Uh, she just had some issues with her small back, or, you know, her lower back. So we need to uh, continue to pray for her. Uh, she asked for prayer specifically because she wasn't feeling very well at all. She was up a lot all night last night. So, um, anybody else? Prayer? Yes, Mark. Uh, Luther, sure, absolutely. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's begin with the Lord's prayer. <clears throat> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debted against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, we just thank you that we can come, and we can worship you this morning. Lord, we thank you that we can come, and, um, and in your name, Lord Jesus... That we request of the Father these requests and you, you hear us from on high. I give you thanks for that, Lord, that you're near enough to us, Lord Jesus, that our requests make it to your throne room from here on earth. And Lord, we just ask that uh, you would be with uh, Marquita this morning, Lord Jesus, as she's going through this emergency surgery. Father, we pray that you bring healing to her body. Pray that you would make it through this without uh, issue or incident, Father, but that you would uh, bring healing and peace to her body. And, Father, that she would be delivered uh, from uh, this ailment and problem in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we pray for the Savoy family, that you be with them in the midst of this sickness. And we pray especially for Mike, that you be near to him, Lord God, give him peace. And, Father, we pray that you touch the kids and that the strep throat will go away and they receive your healing touch in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for Brother David Smith's family this morning, Lord God, that you would be with them and bring peace and strength to them, Lord Jesus, as they grieve this loss uh, of his beloved wife, Lord God, and the, for the church and for everyone else, Father God, we pray. And Lord, we ask that you would be with Lori Fraley this morning as well as Aunt Mary. Lord God, that you would bring uh, peace to the midst of the situation, Lord Jesus, peace for Lori, Lord God, and also healing and strength, Father God, for Mary, that you be near, Lord Jesus, and comfort and bring peace, Father. We pray, uh, Lord, for uh, Debbie Boggs' uh, uh, brother-in-law and sister. Lord, they both need a divine touch from the Lord, Father. I pray that you would touch um, uh, her brother-in-law as he gets ready for surgery, Lord Jesus, and that you bring peace and healing and a quick and expedited recovery, Father, we ask in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, be with uh, Lisa Smithers. She returns home from Illinois, visiting her mom. Pray that you uh, keep her safe on the road, Lord, and all these things. And Lord, we also pray for Kim Lee, that you be with her. Uh, Father God, that uh, you bring healing to her back. Give her rest today, I pray, both her and Chris, and that you will renew her, Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your goodness towards us. We thank you for the grace that you shed abroad in our hearts, Lord Jesus. Father, this morning we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, that you would also show us where to cast our nets. Father, I thank you for last week's service at Stewart Home. And Lord, I, I give you praise that, that uh, Lord Jesus, that, that your Spirit is everywhere and at all times. And it does not predicate, Lord Jesus... That the means of our understanding be even that high. We just need to know, Lord, that you're with us. And I give you praise for that. And I give you praise for the fact that you are with us now. And Lord, I pray that you would let your Holy Spirit reign powerfully true and real in this building and in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said together, Amen. 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 Let's stand and worship the Lord this morning. I have 
the knees hands and multiply God all that I am and find my heart on the altar again set me on fire set me on fire take all I have in these hands and multiply God all that I on the altar again set me on fire set me on fire here i am god on twine of man pouring out my life gracefully broken my heart stands in all of your name, your master stands strong till the end. You will fulfill your purpose for me. You won't forsake me. You will be with me. Because here I am, God, arms wide open, pouring out my life. Holding nothing back, holding nothing back, I surrender, I surrender, I surrender, I surrender. I surrender. Here I am, God.
just watch what he will do if he comes in the grave and there's nothing too great just watch what he will do just watch what he will do you better get ready for a miracle you better get ready for the joy you better get ready for revival cause it's coming yeah it's coming you better get ready for a miracle you better get ready for the joy you better get ready for revival cause it's coming yeah it's coming you better get ready for a miracle you better get ready for the joy you better get ready for revival Just watch what he will do. Just watch what he will do. If he conquered the grave and there's nothing too great, just watch what he will do. Just watch what he will do. You better get ready for a miracle. You better get ready for the joy. You better get Revival, cause it's coming. Yeah, it's coming. You better get ready for the miracle. You better get ready for the joy. You better get ready. Just watch what he will do If he conquered the grave Then there's nothing too great Just watch what he will do Just watch what he will do I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus and I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire and I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over fear and all anxiety To every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadow, burn like a fire. darkness 
in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over claim your name over our family. We claim your name over this church, Lord. Lord, we love you and we're so honored that we can come here together as a family and worship you. Lord, it's something that us in this Western world just takes for granted that we can just get up on a Sunday morning and, and go worship Jesus. Lord, help us to not take that for granted. Lord, I ask that today that you open up our hearts and open up our minds to hear you. Because, Lord, I know you have something for each and every one of us to hear. We love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. know about you, but <clears throat> this was one of those days where I think this was the hardest that the time change ever hit me in my entire life. Yes, yes, I don't know, you know, I, uh, there's multiple things that went through my head. One of them was is that, well, I should probably go to the pulpit and ask that they pray for me. But then I thought, well, you know, I don't know how you feel about that statement when a preacher comes to the pulpit and says, pray for me, like... Oh, this is going to be good. You know what I mean? Like, like he was asking for prayer now. He should have been asking for prayer last week when he was studying, you know. Uh, just one of those things. But uh, I, at one point in time, I said to this morning when we were practicing, uh, I said to Brad, I'm like, man, I wouldn't blame anybody if they didn't come today. <laughs> That's just how tired I felt this morning. But... Uh, Anyway, we'll open your Bibles regardless to Mark chapter 1, and we'll begin reading in verse 9, Mark chapter 1, and we'll read 9 through 15, but also um, Mark uh, chapter 8, verse 31 through 38, Mark chapter 8, verse 31 through 38. Let me uh, begin by saying this, it's very, very rare that I ever start a sermon with a joke, but I just felt like this was very appropriate and meaningful. It goes like this. There's a story 
You know, back in the day, there used to be, you know, Catholic neighborhoods and Protestant neighborhoods. There was just that side of town that you seem like the Catholics all moved into one neighborhood and the Protestants moved in the other. And, uh, and uh, there was a Catholic neighborhood where a new Protestant uh, family had moved in. And the problem with that was is that right around Lent, they don't eat meat on Fridays, they eat fish. So all the families in that neighborhood were enjoying some cold tuna you know, salad on a uh, Friday evening for dinner. And the one Protestant guy is outside uh, with his smoker, you know, grilling uh, a steak. And all the men in the neighborhood were upset about it, <laughs> deeply upset. And then so they, they thought, well, let's get together and let's see if we can convert this guy from a Protestant to a Catholic. So all the temptation on Friday evening dinner will go away. And sure enough, they did. And they brought him to the priest, and the priest looked at him, and he said, Okay, you were born a Baptist, you were uh, raised a Baptist, and uh, now you're a Catholic. And he sprinkled him with water and sent him home. And all the neighborhood men were like, Well, uh, we're so happy that our Lenten temptation is gone from us. Uh, a year later, however, it was a, the first Friday of Lent, and uh, they were enjoying their cold tuna salad on that evening. And all of a sudden, they just begin to smell uh, that smell of, uh, that is, can only be a steak uh, on the grill. And so all the guys get together, and they're, they're, have, they're having an intervention now. Like you, you can't be Catholic and be eating steak on a Friday night. And so they go over there, and they come around the corner of his backyard where the grill is piping hot. And obviously, he's got a steak on the grill. And then just in time, as they turned the corner, they saw him sprinkling some water on the steak. And he said, you were born a cow, you were raised a cow, but now you're a fish. And <laughs> It's a pretty good one. As comical as that is, there is a great truth to this statement, that Jesus is in the business of transfiguration but when Jesus transfigures us, he doesn't change us into something that we are not. He transfigures us into being more human and more divine, which is what we are. And that is why we were created in the image of God. Amen. That the divine rests in you, even though you're human. And that is Jesus in a nutshell. He's both fully God and fully human. And so if we are going to become more like Jesus, then we will become more like God and at the same time, more human. Let's read the scriptures. Mark chapter 1, verse one, verse 9 through 15. It says this in the NIV. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven and said, You are my son whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. Notice the connection of those two events, the baptism of Jesus, and immediately the Spirit sends him to the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed after three days and rise again. And he spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he, rebu he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have the mind or concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And when he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it that someone gain the whole world yet forfeits their soul? Or can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... The Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. Father, I pray that you would explode the word before our eyes, that we can see, that we can understand, 
and we can know how to live this Christian life, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, have started this venture with Bishop Joel uh, Brown uh, to write a book together. And we went through, we had a Zoom call where we kind of, we called it, you know, a writing session or whatnot. And uh, we got to talking about church and they're, they're going through uh, somewhat of a little revival that's happening down there. He, he hesitates to call it that just because of uh, the, the connotations that go with it. But it, it's pretty powerful services that they're having. And, uh, and he said in the midst of this conversation, he said that he was fasting and that he's just praying for God to do what he wants to do. And. I, you know, all of that, I'm like, amen, amen to all of that. And, and then I said, you know, I just have, I've had trouble fasting lately. And, uh, and, and I said, I want to fast, I desire to fast, but along comes about 11 o'clock, and I'm like, I don't really want to fast today. And uh, it's just that kind of natural human experience, I think, to a large degree. And, uh, <clears throat> and so Bishop, you know, kind of took note of that, and then he said, well, you know, I'd love it if we had uh, about six nights a week for about six weeks uh, to, to go, you know, have revival services, basically. And he says, that's what I'm praying for. And I said, I'll be honest with you, that sounds exhausting to me. <laughs> just, <laughs> and then he proceeds that after taking note of the first occurrence that I'm having trouble fasting and then the second occurrence that, that I really wouldn't want to go into services six nights a week for six weeks that... Uh, he goes, well, I think you're just in the flesh, brother. <laughs> you're thinking in the flesh. You're, you're having trouble getting the, the spirit over the flesh right now. Uh, and, th- and there's some truth to that, you know, no doubt, I'm sure, in multiple ways. Uh, and he's talking about being at services six nights a week for six weeks. And uh, so uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, um, if you read this scripture carefully, you'll begin to notice that for Mark... Uh, Peter is the, is the exemplar of Christianity. Now, that's good news for us in multiple ways. It's good news because Peter, in the book of Mark, is a consistent and constant screw-up. Yeah. I mean, rebuking Jesus, you know, that's never going to end very well, I don't think. Uh, if you read the book of Mark very carefully, you'll see that perhaps even Peter is the source of witness for Mark's writing accounts. and The fact that the Lenten season is the same reason that Mark is making Peter his exemplar in the gospel. It's not because of anything that Peter does right, but it's because of the fact that what he does wrong, or despite what he does wrong, Jesus is constantly calling him back, constantly calling him to follow him. I mean, that's the, the continual narrative, even in the rebuke. Now, I can think of some rebukes that I would give people in the church, but I've never gone as far to say, get behind me, Satan, to any of you. I promise you that. Um, I've made some blunders of mistakes of scriptural sort of uh, citations. One of them, my mom, when I was a teenager, looked at me and said, where's your brother at? And I looked at her and I said, am I my brother's keeper? Now, that was a stupid comment. I can just tell you that right now. And I know that she looked at me and she thought, you killed your brother, didn't you? You know, like that's what she, I think that's what she was thinking in her mind. It was just one of those things I took out of context. And later on, when I actually read the scripture and knew it well, I was like, that was wrong. That was very wrong to make that statement. Um, either way, I never called any. I never said, you know, get behind me, Satan. But even in the midst of that correction... What you must realize is that Jesus is rebuking Peter, but he's rebuking Peter and reminding him of his place behind him. If you are a follower of Jesus, it necessarily implies that you are behind him and not in front of him. And so we get this idea that Christ is gone into this wilderness experience so that we can follow him. And that our success is because of Jesus' success, because he's been in the wilderness before us in the first place. That he's paved the way. I love what Anthanasius said, the early church father, Christ has become what we are so that we might become what he is. I'm not sure how your life goes, and I imagine it 
that you feel like Jesus on a regular basis. I know I feel we all do. Out of the frying pan and into the fire, essentially. Out of the baptismal waters of the Jordan and into the fires of the desert. And I don't want to be too awfully metaphorical here, uh, but life has some wild beasts in it. If you'll notice that statement by Mark there at the end of the scripture, it says this, that, and he went into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and with him were some wild animals and angels that attended him. Now that's incredible that angels are attending directly to him, but the knowledge of the fact that Satan is tempting in the wilderness and that there's wild animals on top of it in the wilderness is one of those harrowing statements. And so I think we must acknowledge, too, that our life does and exist, not only temptations by Satan himself, but also the fact that there's some wild animals out there in life with us. Do not be surprised when some of your most ecstatic and powerful moments in your Christian life are backslapped essentially by temptation moments or by wilderness moments or desert moments or moments with wild beasts out there with us. I'm not talking about your spouse or anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, get the idea. Or in Peter's case, after his high of confessing who Jesus is, and Jesus makes the statement, I believe, in the book of Luke, he says, he says, blessed art thou, son of Jonah, you know, that you have identified flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. Now, now notice the contrast there, that Jesus says flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And then moments later, after he rebukes him, he says, you are in the flesh. You have not the mind of the spirit, but you have things concerning the flesh. And so immediately, does anybody else's life feel like that? Momentarily, you're like you make decisions in the spirit. You're full of the Holy Spirit. Five seconds later, you know, you're backslapped by the fact that, well, now I'm of the flesh. And I've got things in the flesh on mine. I don't want to fast for six weeks. I don't want to go to services every night for six weeks. Anybody else feel that? It's just me. I don't know. I'd venture to say at this point that Jesus' rebuke of Peter is mainly this reminder of what a disciple of Jesus Christ looks like. is behind Jesus, not in front of him rebuking him. That is our position. This is true uh, to a large degree of technology. I mean, they're talking about AI technology that surpasses people. College students are writing papers using artificial intelligence. Give me a break. You know, like... When I was in college, some of the papers that I turned in were handwritten and not actually used. That's mind-blowing. It's not even that long ago. And now they're talking about writing papers with artificial intelligence and that they're having problems at universities because students, they can't even discern whether this was written by the student or written by artificial intelligence. Just an FYI, all the kids in here, if you ever write a paper with AI, you're going to have to pay me. Okay? You're in trouble. You'll find out. Don't worry about it. I'm glad that you don't know what it is. (laughs) Of all the beauties of technology that it brings us, global positioning satellites are not one of the best refined ones. You can have where you would think that GPS should take you in the exact right location at the exact right time in the exact right best way. That doesn't often happen that way. And if you have any knowledge of where you're actually going with the GPS, you can say, well, why did it take me there? I don't understand this. It's not taking me where I think it should take me. And sometimes the best way to get to a place where you're unfamiliar is is that you have that comment when somebody's driving in front of you and they reach out, they, they turn out the window and they say, just follow me because I know the way to go. And that is essentially what this story is all about, that that if your life, if you become a trailblazer in the new territory of life, you may need to evaluate what path you're on, because unlikely that is Jesus' path, okay? Jesus was the trailblazer. He blazed the trail, not only in life, but through the wilderness for us, so that we can follow him. Jesus doesn't ask us to be trailblazers or self-made or self-made men and women. But he chooses to the path of followership, that we should follow him. 
It's interesting in Mark's account of the wilderness temptation for 40 days that he couples it this almost perfectly and seamlessly with Jesus' baptism. It's almost they're like one event. Jesus was baptized. He didn't have time to go out to eat and celebrate. And they didn't go to O'Charlie's or, you know, Stit Longhorn or anything like that. It was just like, all right, he's going directly from his baptism out into the wilderness. And Jesus was led there after he you know, basically still sopping wet as he, as he walks into the, the, the wilderness. The church fathers and mothers said that Jesus was not baptized for the washing away of sins, but he was actually baptized because he was purifying the waters of baptism for us. That's what he was doing there. The same with the desert, too. That Jesus didn't have to go into the desert so that he would go through temptation and then be able to successfully be tested, but rather he went into the desert so that he would purify the desert because he knew we would be going into the desert too. Yes, sir. And he readied the desert for us. In a very real sense, Jesus made the pathway from the baptismal waters and out of the waters that we follow him out of those baptismal waters and into the desert also. The desert of all of life's experiences, the desert of all of life's temptations. Jesus has blazed a trail in the wilderness so that we can follow him and that we can follow him safely and even in the midst of wild animals, whether they're there or not. 1 Corinthians says something very similar in chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind and common to Jesus, I might add. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted... He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. That way out, or maybe best said, Jesus is the way out. Yes. That he's paved this way out of temptation. Temptation is sure. It's going to happen. Temptation is going to happen on multiple fronts in multiple ways, even in the very most uh, weakness parts of our life. That's <laughs> sure to happen. Yes. However, we are True to know that Jesus has given us a way out, and that way is him. That way is through Jesus, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. If we follow him, we can successfully get through temptation. Temptation is not sin, but falling into temptation is, of course. The image of the Holy Spirit in the form of the dove coming out of heaven is very important. Um, Doing life without the Holy Spirit remaining in your life is no easy task. I, I believe that with all my heart. Uh, for Pentecostals, this moment is when Jesus comes up out of the, the baptismal waters, and then uh, John sees that the, the Holy Spirit descends on him in the form of a dove and then remains, meaning like this is his spirit baptism for Pentecostals. This is the moment Jesus was spirit baptized, and the Holy Spirit remains upon him. Um, and, and I'm not saying that spirit baptism is like a cure-all for all of life's desert experiences, but I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I would much rather go into desert experiences full of the Holy Spirit than uh, full of anything else, you know, especially the flesh. <laughs> I mean, I would, if I'm going to go into the desert, if I'm going to go into temptation moments, I certainly would be rather full of the Holy Spirit than full of anything else. And... Um, this is true in so many fashions that there, there are moments where I believe that, that we need to take and take stock as we get to go into a situation. Life, you know, goes better with prayer uh, than it does without. Uh, so when you maybe are headed to work in the morning, spend some time in prayer, uh, just asking the Lord's blessing upon the day and that you would make decisions and do things full of the Holy Spirit and full of discernment. I mean, uh, let me put it in these terms. Uh, not long ago, I, and I've mentioned this to you before, I was in a conflict with someone, and uh, they did the best to coax me into a literal fight. It was like high school all over again, you know. And uh, they were in my face and using profanities and uh, and, and trying to coax me in this literal fight. And, and finally, I just, I just resolved in my mind in that moment. I just said, listen, if you hit me, I'm faster than you are, and I can run away faster. You know, that's, that's basically just what I said. I said, I'm not a violent person, and I'm not going to fight you. And uh, uh, not that I wouldn't defend myself in some circumstances, but you get the idea. I wasn't going to fight this guy. 
It wasn't going to happen. And, uh, um, and, and you might think, like, well, look at him. I don't think he was faster than another person. But, you know, it's, there was a bluff there maybe to some degree, uh, you know, that I'm fast. Uh, but uh, I was, was I tempted to hit him? Sure, sure. I had, like, 50 pounds on the guy. I'm a guaranteeing that I, I, I'm not guaranteeing that I won, but it's possible that I would have won. You know what I'm saying? Uh, just in my own fleshly thinking. But the truth is that the spirit prevailed in my life. I went into this desert temptation. I was prayed up. I was filled up. I was ready for whatever might happen. The spirit worked his grace of self-control, of a sound mind, of peace, and of joy in those moments instead of violence. Now, this is the thing. Now, you can say what you want to about self-defense and, and, and all of the different things that you may have done in a situation or have done in a situation like that. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, as I remind the Stuart Homeschool students all the time, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That, that last one is probably the most important one. Self-control. That you can control yourself. You, you know, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit are not violence. One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is not anger beyond control. One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit are not hitting. You know what I'm saying? Like, it just doesn't work that way. And I think this is, is a desert experience that I just recounted for you, no doubt. But it's meant that Jesus would transfigure us. This process does not come without testing, trials, and hardships in the desert. Ultimately... Uh, it will result in death so that Christ can live in us. Yeah. So that you begin making decisions like Jesus made decisions because your flesh is no longer alive and the spirit is so alive in you that now it's not you that thinks, but it's Jesus thinking in you. That's why Paul said, put on the mind of Christ. Clothe yourself in Jesus Christ. So that in whatever situation you're in, whatever hardship that you're in, whatever temptation it may be, you start doing and acting and thinking, actually thinking like Jesus thinks. Do you remember Israel's reoccurring question to Moses? The Egyptians were pursuing the, them with chariots and horsemen, and they said, was it because there were no graves in Egypt? There's a lot of sarcasm there. Yeah. That you brought us out in the desert to die? Another time it was because they had nothing to eat in the desert, and their reply to Moses was, would that we had died in the Lord's hand in Egypt, and that we had pots of meat, and we ate ourselves full of bread. For you have brought us out in the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And I really think that Moses and the Israelites totally missed the point of the desert experience. I believe that God brought the Israelites out into the desert to die. That was the purpose, to die to their flesh and become alive in the spirit. So that it no longer would be their flesh speaking. Think of, think of what their concerns were. Well, there's no graves in Egypt. Well, there's nothing to eat here in the wilderness. Well, we had plenty to eat. We had plenty to fill our stomachs with. Remember the indictment often is, is that their gods were their stomach. Romans chapter 1. Their gods, whatever their appetites were, they went after those things. Because they were governed by their appetites. And Christian life is really the opposite of that. It means that you crucify your passions because Christ becomes your only passion. So all the things that this life has to offer, all the passions that you can give yourself to, ultimately will become a prison to you because they'll become your God. And you begin to worship them. And yet Christ leads us into the desert so all of these passions can be crucified to the cross so that we can begin to live for Jesus Christ. It, it, is, it may not sound, it may, may sound polarizing to you, but I believe that fleshly appetites are mutually exclusive to the spirit's appetites. The flesh desires one thing, the spirit desires, desires another thing. Yes, and, and they're in conflict, in war with one another. Do, do you hear the Pauline scriptures here? They're, they're constantly in battle with one another. Paul says, I don't do what I want to do because I do what I don't want to do. That's that warring together of the fleshly appetites and the spirit's appetites. Ultimately, we desire that these desert experiences would bring us to some nature of transfiguration 
so that Jesus changes us to his image. He changes us even down to our appetites, down to our hungers in life. Jesus means that by our death to the flesh, that we are transfigured into the image of Jesus Christ. I know I say it often, but it's one of those things. Like Jesus walked the Via Della Rosa. He told the disciples, his followers, over and over again, take up your cross and follow me. That was before he was ever crucified. Do you think that, that, that Jesus has a different path that he took? The Via Della Rosa is your path. The way of the cross. The cross is the path that Jesus has laid out for you, and he means that you should die. Die to the flesh. Die to your sins so that you can be alive in Jesus Christ. That is the path of Christianity. I don't want you to have illusions that if you come to Christ or that you give up certain things, that prosperity will come your way and everything is beautiful and flowery. Uh, Honestly, I believe that if you become a Christian today, that life will get insanely harder. That's why Paul said, I'm speaking as if I'm out of my mind. That's why I say insanely harder. It's not going to get easier. It will get much harder. I just want to be truthful as I can about Christian life. Not saying that it won't be fulfilling. In fact, I am saying that it will be fulfilling. Fulfilling beyond measure of any prosperity this world could ever offer you. That's what Christ does. In all of these stories of the miraculous Jesus did on earth... You always see the same continuity. The blind man became a seeing man. The woman with the issue of blood became a woman without the issue of blood. The dead little girl and dead little boy became the live little girl and live little boy. The man with the shriveled hand was a man with a healed hand. The fish and the bread at the feeding of the 5,000 were still fish and bread. They were just multiplied. So you may have wondered, isn't turning water into wine something that it is not? No, really, the substance of every beverage, pretty much an ironclad argument, is water. It's irrefutable. God is not in the business of changing a person into something completely different. He's in the business of changing us to look more like himself. Let me go as far to say this. God did not change the Gerasian demoniac into a bird or a cat. The pigs that he sent the demons into were still pigs. Jesus transfigures us into the image of our true being by his power. Most certainly, let me say it as clear as this, Jesus does not change males to females and vice versa or anything in between. It's pretty clear. Jesus is in the work of transfiguration, meaning that he's going to bring you into the fullest nature of your being. Which is to be like Christ. You see, there's a clear delineation to Satan's temptation in the wilderness. Satan tempted Jesus to do something that would be a change of nature beyond transfiguration. Remember the three temptations. The first one was Satan wanted Jesus to turn rocks into bread, something they're not. One, one, One early church father said this. I thought it was really thoughtful. Um, uh, we requested uh, uh, rocks and Jesus gave us bread. <laughs> Isn't that a great statement? Like, even in our prayers that are often amiss, how many of you have prayed for things not knowing what you really needed? Or prayed for things in the flesh and prayed amiss, totally his, missed the mark in, in prayer? Only to realize that Jesus gave us exactly what we needed. And sometimes that was nothing at all. Remember the three temptations. He wanted Jesus to make a deal with the devil. And take back the nations by relinquishing his worship to Satan. And lastly to jump from the temple so angels could make him fly. If Jesus had done any of these things he would have ceased to be human. God could do these things but it. What would it mean for Jesus to do these things? It would mean that he would no longer be human. Jesus is not Merlin the wizard. Jesus is not Superman. Jesus is both God and man. And to do any of these things, Jesus would have to relinquish his humanity and become something he was not. 
comes, becomes something he was never meant to be. Therefore, it's logical to believe that if Jesus transfigures us, then we will only look more human and more like God of whom Jesus is the perfect human. I can't emphasize this enough. Do you want to live the fullness of the human life? I mean, are you tired of, of doing things and trying to be things that, that, that are not yourself? If you want to live the fullness of what human life has to offer, then you need to look nowhere else than Jesus Christ. Yes, he is the perfect human. He is the prototype of humanity. Yes. And if you want to be fully human and experience all that life has to offer for you, then you have nothing else to look forward to than becoming Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Just him. Just him. Seek first the kingdom of God and all this other stuff that you're worried about yes. will be added to you. There's another 40 days that I think is necessary. Can I have a, Ryan, Kim, can you help me get the whiteboard and a couple markers for me? Um, the 40 days are significant in scripture. If you read the scripture well, you see that 40 days is sort of a repeated thing. Um, and one of those 40-day moments uh, uh, beyond uh, the 40 days of the wilderness, the 40 years, uh, which is a recapitulation of Israel's 40 years in the desert. Thank you so much. That's good. Um, is another 40 days, uh, and that was Noah's 40 days. First Peter 3 reminds us that we are saved from death through the death of Jesus Christ. And just as God was patient in the days of Noah, he's patient with humanity now. Now, the ark was, anybody remember the dimensions? If you think of it, it was probably more like a big rectangle, 450 feet long, uh, probably more cubic than anything, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Um, because of its size, you could imagine uh, that in the ancient Near East, uh, and this is obviously before the time of Christ, but uh, the ancient Near East, that if you started building a massive box that you called a boat, basically, uh, whether it had a bow or not, we don't really know for sure, um, that that would probably draw some attention in society. <laughs> well, God told Moses to do this, and Moses would have referred them to God any time that somebody came to ask what in the world he was doing. And so in the midst of that, did, did I say? What did I, who did I say? Moses. Okay, I apologize. Moses. Moses didn't have a boat. Uh, <laughs> everybody wants a boat, though. I don't know who you are. Every male I know wants a boat. I'm sure Moses wanted one, too. So anyway, Noah had a boat. <clears throat> and... Uh, so however you look at it, you know, I'm not a drawer, but this, this is, let's put a bow on this side. That might make it look better too. Um, so this is the ark, right? And, and the, what we begin to understand about the ark is, is that, uh, uh, especially in 1 Peter, it says this in verse 21 and 23 of chapter 3. Corresponding to this, baptism saves you not of the removal of dirt of the flesh, but is an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone through heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subject to him. Now, he's speaking in context of Noah's ark and, and that specifically that we have this issues of death. And so we know that those who rejected the ark were left outside of it here in what are the waters of death. And so this is what covered the earth. Water covered the earth, which is death. So Peter's picking up this logic that, uh, that this was a cleansing that happened. And that there was death in the water, essentially. Or death would cause, uh, be caused by the water. And Peter says, well, this is baptism. That there's a cleansing. Just like the earth was cleansed of wickedness through the flood waters of Noah's day. Um, all those, eight in all, that entered into the ark were saved. And they were saved because of the ark itself. 
The ark saved them. So if we look at this in terms of Peter's metaphor, the truth is, is this, that death is coming for all of us. If you want to be saved from the waters of death, you have no other choice but to enter into the ark who is Jesus Christ. He's your only way out. And so the waters of baptism are similar, that we are baptized into Christ. We have to enter into Christ. Therefore, we are saved from the death of the waters. And we are cleansed from them. So how can you both experience the cleansing, but also be saved from death? You have to enter into Jesus Christ. Yes, you do. And this is this truth uh, that we understand in the midst of the flood waters. The truth that we understand that, that, that we are saved from death by the death of Jesus Christ. Just as the members of Noah's family were saved as they entered into the ark, because the ark floated in the waters. And it was only, now this is what you have to, to, to read closely here. The reason that we are saved is because the waters of death did not touch us. But the waters of death most assuredly contacted Jesus. Yeah. He died so that I can live. Yeah. Do you remember the old song? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, that's why we can live. That's why we can face tomorrow. That's why we can understand what human life is all about. Is because Christ died so that we can live. And he is the ark. Um, I've done many baptisms in my years of ministry. However... There's not a single person that I ever left underwater. There's a few that I thought about leaving underwater. I thought that that might be better than letting them up, but, you know, I did. I brought them all up out of the water. And after you baptize somebody, you don't leave them down. You bring them back up. And so that's the significance of the resurrection. That Christ not only died for our sins, but he... He rose again. Yes, sir. Or in other terms, in this metaphor of Peter, Noah and his family left the ark after they were delivered from the waters of death and they reestablished themselves on the earth. And then they were fruitful and multiplied, and, that, and then in a multiple of ways. And there's a paradox there, no doubt, with Noah growing a vineyard right after he gets out and then getting drunk with the vineyard. There's some, there's some, anybody ever done that? <laughs> you know I'm saying? Not literally, but I'm saying anybody ever, anybody ever fell back into sin after you've been delivered from it? But just as God allowed the floodwaters to recede and the ark came to rest upon the mountain, Noah's family emerges from the ark and begins a new life in the land. And so we emerge from the waters of baptism and begin a new life on the earth. This new way of life is totally subject to Jesus as Lord. If Jesus is at the right hand of God, then all things are subject to him in heaven and earth. You know, life has a, a funny way of showing us what submission to Christ is or lordship really is. It's very hard for us in the West to understand that where you have statement like, uh, you know, he's not my president and things like that. You know, like, well, yeah, he is the president. Whether you like it or not, he's yeah. the president. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like... Like, you, we don't understand what Lord means. Does that make sense? We don't have a monarchy. We don't have, a, we don't have a, a king in our country. We elect people. But in a, in a kingdom, they're king. And that's the end of the story. Jesus is the king. And we are subject to him. Before you are ever subject to a law of the United States of America, you are subject to the laws of the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Like, I, I'm not being anti, anarchal or anything like that. I'm just saying there is a greater law, and that's the law of Jesus Christ. The law of love is what I'm trying to convey to you. But life has this funny way of, of teaching us lordship one way or the other, and... 
uh, basically, you know, when you would come into the presence of the king, you would bow low because he's the king, you know. And uh, as you get older, uh, we, we understand this too. Uh, you get older, you begin to shrink a little bit. You lose a few inches. Uh, some people stoop as they walk. Um, after a while, as you get older, you, things start to sag in multiple ways, and then you get lower that way. And then at the end of your life, you get real low. You get six feet under. You know, like that's, that's the, the knowledge. Jesus is a different type of king. He's a different king than we understand on this earth. And he ascended to heaven so that we would become his loyal subjects under him. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Or like Jesus said to Peter, get behind me. Get behind me, Peter. Let me leave you with this thought. The desert experience reminds us that life is filled with temptations and hardships. Yes. This 40 days of Lent is just a reminder of all these things. It's a reminder that, that life is a desert. There's wild animals in it. The remark about Jesus living in the desert with wild animals signals to us that Jesus is the second Adam. Before the fall of creation, Adam tended to both the garden and the animals of the field. And he was at harmony with all of them. And now Jesus is retelling the story that he's not in the garden. Now he's in the desert and he's out among non-tame animals. And there's no provision in the desert of abundant fruit trees like Adam, the first Adam, had. And yet Jesus succeeds where Adam fails. Isn't that incredible? He didn't have anything, none of the resources that Adam had in the desert. But yet Jesus still succeeds. Even to the degree that Adam had an angel in the garden who barred him from ever entering it again. Jesus had angels in the desert who came and ministered to him. Do you see the parallel there? There's two ways you can live this life. There's a way you can live this life like the first Adam. Wanting even something that you're disobedient to get. Yes. God's given us all things for life and godliness. I think that's the story of Adam. He's given us everything. Yes, but yet we wanted more. All of us have. All of us have fallen lust to the temptation of something that we were not supposed to touch. But there's a better way of life, and it's in a different garden. And that garden is the Garden of Gethsemane. That's the garden that says, it's not my will, Lord, but thy will be accomplished. In the Garden of Eden, there was the Garden of Failure. The Garden of Self-Interest. The Garden of what I want, not what God wants. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is victorious because he said, not my will. But thy will be accomplished. He was obedient, as Paul would say, even unto death. And that's why God raised him from the dead. So the story plays out over and over and over again. When God bids a person to come, he bids him to come and die. Or in other terms, as the scripture said in Mark, he called the crowd and the disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. If you want to save your life, you're going to lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel, they will save it. What good is it to gain all the world, everything that it has to offer, and to lose your soul? Have you chosen to enter the ark today? Have you chosen a life of obedience over a life of self-interest? Listen, there's a reason that that metaphor uh, is repeated multiple times. Take up your cross and follow me. It's because it's a daily action. It's not something that you could do one time. It's not a one-time occurrence. It's a daily walk to follow Jesus on the Via Della Rosa. Will it, that struggle end one day? Praise God that it will end one day. Amen. But it's not that day yet. 
One day when you get a glorified body and are no longer able to fall into temptation because we are hidden totally with Christ in Him, then you can rest. But until then, this is a bit of a fight. Amen. Let me pray for you this morning. Lord, I thank you. As paradoxical as it seems to live Christian life, we think of fullness, but our version of fullness may not be accurate, Lord. Let us begin to learn to clothe ourselves with Jesus Christ and put on the mind of Christ so that we can live the full life. Bid us, Lord, to come and die, to crucify our flesh. Bid us, Lord, to enter into the ark so that we might be saved. Saved from ourselves, saved from our sins, saved from our addictions, saved, Lord Jesus, from every fleshly desire so that we can seek first the kingdom. If your heart is pricked this morning and you just need to just tell the Lord that I'm crucifying my flesh today, Lord. Would you just raise your hand just as a sign to me not, and to the Lord, not anybody else. Just a sign to me and to the Lord. Thank you. Lord, those specifically that raise their hand, I pray that, Father, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would just begin to rest on them. Just as you went into the wilderness, Lord Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, I pray that they too would go into the wilderness, Lord God, the wilderness of life, full of the Holy Spirit. Give them the fullness of the Holy Spirit so they can live victoriously, Lord Jesus, beyond measure, beyond what their flesh can do, I pray. Lord, I pray the same for all of us, that you be with us, Lord, help us to walk the cruciform life, the way of the cross. Help us, Lord Jesus, to not only live, Lord Jesus, daily crucifying our flesh, but Lord Jesus, help us live in the resurrection power that you gave us. The same power that raised you from the dead is at work within our mortal bodies. And we give you praise for that, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anoint us today, Lord Jesus, that we might live fully towards you. We ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said together, I can think of no more appropriate song than this one, Jesus Paid It All. Let's sing to the Lord this morning. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find me in thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow.
before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save My lips shall still repeat Cause Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow He washed it white as snow He washed it white as snow Oh, praise the one. And oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up oh, from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Jesus paid his Stain. He washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Just want to remind you that if you haven't picked up a copy, they're free in the foyer. It's called Soul Care. It's a devotional for this Lenten fasting season. I've hoping you. You've taken the time to, to read it and to really wrestle through it and, and, uh, and take some time to care for your souls. Um, but let me bless you today and, and just pray for you that uh, the Lord would be with you. I pray that everybody gets a nap this afternoon um, <laughs> and that you're not too tired on Monday. Father, I pray that you would bless us and that you would keep us, that you would turn your face towards us, that the light of the glory of your face would shine upon us, Lord Jesus, that you'd be gracious unto us. Lord Jesus, let everything that we put forth our hands, Lord Jesus, uh, to do, Lord, if we do them in your name, that they would prosper. We ask this in Jesus' name. And the church said together, amen, amen. amen. Be blessed. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Because he I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know that he the future. Life is worth the living just because he lives. The Lord. Told Noah, there's gonna be a floody, floody Lord. 